In the previous video, I gave you the background of how we classify second order partial differential equations into hyperbolic, parabolic, and elliptic forms. Remember the characteristics are curves along which information propagates within the solution domain. So now we want to look at those three particular cases. I'll give you three examples of PDEs that are of each of those types. We'll look at the nature of the characteristics, how the solution propagates through space and or time, and we'll get a better feel for the types of initial and or boundary conditions that are required for these. And again, the point of this is to provide a mathematical foundation for how we're going to develop numerical methods to solve these equations that are faithful to the mathematics of the equations. So let's start with hyperbolic equations. So if we go back to this expression that we had in the last video, remember we got the solution for the slope dy dx as b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Obviously that's the quadratic formula and that's the solution for the slope dy dx of one of these characteristics. And remember that the nature of the b squared minus 4ac determines the type of equation, whether it's hyperbolic, parabolic, or elliptic. So let's start with the hyperbolic case. So in a hyperbolic case, the b squared minus 4ac is positive. Take the square root, that's a real number. And so we have two real roots, two real characteristics of our partial differential equation. The slopes of those could be specified as lambda 1 and lambda 2, according to those two real roots. Now if the a, b, c coefficients are constants, they don't necessarily have to be, but, but let's simplify things for ourselves here and assume that the coefficients a, b, and c, remember those are the coefficients of the second derivative terms, let's assume those are constants, in which case our lambda 1 and lambda 2 will just be constants as well from that quadratic formula that we just had a moment ago. So if that's true, if lambda 1 and lambda 2 are constants, we can integrate to get y as a function of x, and they'll just be straight lines. y is equal to lambda 1x plus gamma 1, where gamma 1 is just a constant, and y is equal to lambda 2x plus gamma 2. So two straight line characteristics through the domain if a, b, and c happen to be constant. Then these will just be curves. But let's think about this case just to simplify things. So the canonical example of a hyperbolic equation is the wave equation. It's partial squared u partial t squared is equal to sigma squared times partial squared u partial x squared. The u here is a function of the two independent variables x and t. You'll notice we have t instead of y, so it's x and t instead of x and y. The mathematics is no different. So we have u as a function of x and t, and then the sigma squared, that's the, the wave speed the speed at which a wave travels through this particular medium. So again, we're going to say that y is now t. a is the coefficient of the uxx term. That's this one. So that's sigma squared. And then there is no mixed derivative term. A mixed derivative term would be a partial squared u, partial x, partial t. We do not have such a term. So b is equal to 0. And then c is the coefficient of the uyy, or here the utt term which is just minus one, if I bring this over to the right-hand side. So I have my a, my b, and my c. So I can evaluate the b squared minus 4ac, and then put that into my quadratic formula, and we have that the lambda one and lambda two are simply one over sigma and minus one over sigma. Notice what the lambda one and lambda two are. They are the slopes in these straight line characteristic curve equations. So the slopes, correspond to plus and minus the reciprocals of the wave speed. So this is what it looks like. This is the x-axis, and t is going up. So we start at an initial time, t is equal to zero with some amplitude u. So say we introduce disturbances at two points, x1 and x2. Those disturbances are going to generate a left-moving wave and a right-moving wave, each disturbance. So that's what these lines represent. And again, because the a, b's, and c's are constants now, for the sake of discussion, these left and right moving waves are straight lines. And they have slope 1 over sigma and 1 over minus sigma. Now you'll notice if you have two disturbances, these waves will cross. You get all of the wonderful interference effects when waves interact with each other, which we're not going to get into here. But what I want to look at is the point P, call it capital P here, where these two waves intersect. And let's introduce the idea of the domain of influence and the domain of dependence. The domain of influence is every point in the domain 
that influences the solution at a particular point. So the domain of influence of this point P is everything in this triangle here. So whatever is happening in this triangle can affect the solution at P. Not out here, because out here those waves never intersect with P. All right, now the DOD, similar idea, that's the domain of dependence. So those are the points in the domain for which P influences their solution. So if something happens at P, what are the points, the domain of dependence, in the domain for which the solution at P can influence their solution? And that's this cone between these two waves. Again, what happens here can't affect what happens outside that cone because they do not even feel the effects of the disturbance because the wave has not reached that point yet. So we're going to track these DOIs and DODs in these three different types of equations and you'll see very, very different characteristics. Now one thing you'll notice is we only need here two initial conditions. If this is an infinite string, say, and there are no ends, no boundaries, then we just need an initial condition which tells us u at t is equal to zero, the amplitude of the disturbance at t is equal to zero, and then the solution propagates forward in time along these waves. Now in fluid dynamics, just as an example of where PDEs arise, some examples of hyperbolic equations are the unsteady and viscid flow and steady supersonic and viscid flow. Now these are rather specialized situations, so we're actually not going to focus much on hyperbolic equations. We'll talk about them a, a bit much later on, but we're going to focus our attention on parabolic and elliptic equations primarily in terms of our numerical methods and algorithms discussion to come. All right, let's look at the parabolic equations. So in a parabolic equation, remember b squared minus 4ac is equal to zero. So then we just have b over 2a. There's only one real root and therefore one characteristic within the domain. So then dy dx is just that b over 2a, regardless of whether a and b are constants or not. If the a and b are constants, then we can once again integrate, and we have b over 2a times x plus gamma 1, which again is a straight line. So the solution is going to propagate along one linear characteristic direction. Normally that's time, but it could be a spatial dimension. I'll show you an example of that in a, in a moment as well. So the canonical equation that is of parabolic form is the 1D unsteady diffusion equation. So it could be heat diffusion, species diffusion, diffusion of whatever. So that's partial U partial T is equal to alpha partial squared U partial X squared. Now you notice this looks very similar to the wave equation. The difference is this is now only a first derivative rather than a second derivative. That completely changes the character of the equation. That completely changes the nature of the solutions and that has an effect on the numerical methods that we can utilize for solving such parabolic equations as compared to hyperbolic equations. Once again, our second independent variable now is time instead of y, so the y before will become a t. The a, again, is the coefficient of the uxx term. That's alpha. That's the diffusivity of whatever's diffusing, heat or whatever. b and c are both zero. There is no uxt term and there's no utt term as there was in the wave equation. So b and c are both zero. We just have a being non-zero. So because b is equal to zero, look what happens here. So b is equal to zero. So y is just equal to a constant. y is equal to a constant is just a straight line in our xt domain that is parallel to the x-axis corresponding to a given time. So our characteristics are just evolving through the domain with increasing time, just as you would expect physically. That's the propagation of the solution. Let's talk about the DOI and DOD. If I take a point P on that characteristic, the domain of influence will be every point at earlier times. Anything that happens anywhere in this domain of influence could have an influence on the solution at P. Likewise, what happens at P could affect the solution at any later time in the domain, both temporally and spatially. So you can see this is very different than the cones that correspond to the left and right moving waves that we had in the hyperbolic case. Now in this case, we'll have an initial condition, just like we did before, and we will also have boundary conditions on the left and the right. So you could think of this as a rod has an initial temperature distribution, that's the initial condition, 
u is a function of x at t is equal to zero, then boundary conditions on the temperature that govern how the temperature across the length of the rod from x1 to x2 evolves with time. So we need one initial condition and two boundary conditions. Now some examples in fluid mechanics, uh, unsteady Navier-Stokes equations, unsteady heat transfer or energy equation, those are examples of parabolic equations. If, if you're familiar with these topics, you can look at those equations and confirm that they are indeed parabolic. Likewise, the steady boundary layer equations are also parabolic, even though they're steady, so they do not change with time. And so now it's x and y are the independent variables. Because a is equal to zero, b is equal to zero, and c is equal to one, it turns out that this is a parabolic equation forward in x. Rather than forward in time, it's forward in x. So the idea of a boundary layer is you have a boundary, and then there's a boundary layer of fluid along that boundary. It's very thin, across which you have boundary layer profiles that look something like this. For your fluid dynamics geeks, you'll understand the no-slip condition and all the reasons behind this. And so we would have an initial condition at x is equal to zero, and that evolves forward in x. So the solution is parabolic in x rather than parabolic in time. Okay, finally, let's look at the elliptic case. So an elliptic equation, remember there are no real characteristics. So what that means is disturbances, if there's a disturbance anywhere in the domain, it will propagate with an infinite speed in all directions. So another way to think about it is a disturbance anywhere affects the solution everywhere instantaneously. Now all this infinite speed, instantaneous stuff, that's because there is no time. There's no time over which things to evolve. So diffuse, for example. So everything is happening instantaneously. So that has tremendous implications for the boundary conditions we need and therefore the types of numerical solution techniques that we would apply to these equations. The standard canonical case is Laplace's equation, partial square to u partial x squared plus partial square to u partial y squared is equal to zero. The Poisson equation is just a non-homogeneous form of the Laplace equation. So this governs, for example, 2D steady heat conduction, potential flow, and many, many other topics that you've heard me discuss over the various videos. So in this case now, uxx has a coefficient one, so a is one. There are no uxy terms, so b is zero. And the coefficient of uyy, well, that's just one, so c is equal to one. So b squared minus four ac is negative, no real roots, so it's an elliptic equation infinite speed of propagation of solution throughout the domain. What that means is that we now have what's known as a boundary value problem. The other two cases are initial value problems. You start with initial condition and you march in time or possibly in x as we saw. Now we have a boundary value problem. There is no time, so there's no initial condition. So now we have a closed domain. It's a boundary value problem. We need values on the boundary all the way around the domain. The domain of influence and domain of dependence of a point in the domain is everywhere throughout the domain. So anything that happens anywhere else in the domain will affect what happens at point P. And likewise, whatever happens at point P will affect the solution everywhere else in the domain. Now for a boundary value problem, we need a boundary condition at every point on the boundary of the domain, which is this rectangle now. So we need to know u or we need to know the normal derivative of u, for example, at every point on the boundary in order to have a closed system for the solution of our elliptic equation. In fluid mechanics, examples of elliptic equations are the steady Navier-Stokes. Remember, unsteady Navier-Stokes was parabolic. So steady Navier-Stokes, steady energy equation, those are both now elliptic. And potential flow is governed by Laplace's equation. So that's elliptic. And Poisson equations, it turns out, govern pressure and stream function govern in fully viscous cases. And we'll talk more about that in a later chapter. So we can characterize them as either hyperbolic, parabolic, elliptic, or initial value and boundary value problems. So parabolic and hyperbolic equations are examples of initial value problems, and elliptic equations are examples of boundary value problems. Now there's one other possibility we need to talk about, and that is if a, b, and c, the coefficients on the second derivative terms, if those are functions of x and y, then the character of the equation could actually change from one region of the domain to another because the b squared minus 4ac may change signs. So an example of that is in transonic flow. 
we have this equation that governs 2D steady compressible potential flow about a slender body. It's a very specific situation. I won't talk about where this equation comes from, but it looks very similar to the Laplace equation, but it has this coefficient 1 minus the Mach number squared. Mach number is related to the speed of disturbances traveling through the flow relative to the speed of sound. So what happens is if you look at the b squared minus 4ac, it's minus 4 times the quantity 1 minus m squared. So the b squared minus 4ac then depends on the Mach number. If the Mach number is less than 1, which we call subsonic, then b squared minus 4ac would be negative, and we would have an elliptic equation. If Mach number is equal to 1, so that's the speed of sound, that's the sonic condition, then b squared minus 4ac is equal to 0, and that would give us a parabolic equation. Remember, it's the same equation we're talking about. It just takes on these different forms depending on the value of the Mach number. If it's supersonic, Mach number greater than 1, so you're traveling faster than the speed of sound, then b squared minus 4ac is bigger than 0, and that's a hyperbolic equation. So that's if you have one equation, but with different characters depending on your location in the flow, spatially or temporally. The other possibility is you could have different governing equations in different regions, and they could have different characters. So the boundary layer case that we mentioned a, mo a moment ago, we have the surface, we have the edge of the boundary layer. Inside the boundary layer, we would have the steady boundary layer equations. As we said, those are parabolic. However, outside the boundary layer, out here, we have a different set of governing equations for steady and viscid flow, and those happen to be elliptic. So different equations with different mathematical characteristics in different regions of the flow. So these are obviously much more complex. We'll be focusing on the situations where the whole flow is parabolic or the whole flow is elliptic in the coming videos.